Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So welcome everybody um, to this event on um, on port cities, port cities as portals, as spaces of um, liminal encounters and also as infrastructure spaces. I'm going to be um, talking you through this event. My name is Cornelia Grebner. Um, I'm a lecturer, senior lecturer in comparative literature and Hispanic studies. And um, this is the second, well, really, it's the third in a series of events we've um, run together with OVEO at the Winter Warmer. We had um, two very good events um, last year, and Eleanor Rees, who is um, with us this year, participated in um, in those events as well. I think you can view those online, actually, on the um, on the OVEO YouTube channel. Um, and um, yeah, so first of all, very warm welcome to everybody. Um, welcome to everyone who's here online and to everyone who's there in person in Cork. Um, we are going to listen to the readings of um, four wonderful poets. Um, and that's um, in that sequence, Mary Noonan, Eleanor Rees, Greg Query and Matthew Geddon. Um, it's a connection really between Cork and Liverpool that we started last year and that hopefully um, will continue in the future. Um, and um, just to do a little bit of, um, give you a little bit of an orientation of how the event is going to work, um, the poets are going to read. Um, after each reading, I may pick up on a few themes that we um, can bring back later on in our discussion or conversation. Um, about the ways in which poems and poetry engages with these very special places, um, which are ports and shorelines. Um, obviously, as human beings, we aren't the only ones who inhabit those ports and shorelines. There's all the elements as well. There's water, there's air, there's, of course, the land. Um, and there's um, many forms of non-human life. Um, ranging from animals um, to plant life um, to the actual topography um, of those spaces. Um, and um, we can sort of come back to that and explore um, these, these themes in a conversation afterwards between the poets, which will be moderated by myself. Obviously, this is a hybrid event, so um, I'm going to address everyone directly. Um, just to make it a little bit um, a little bit easier on us, and um, we're going to start um, today's readings with Mary Noonan. Um, Mary teaches French literature at University College Cork. Um, her first collection was *The Fado House*, and it was published in 2012 by Didalus. It was shortlisted for the Seamus Heaney Centre Prize and the Strong Shine Award. And a limited pamphlet, Father, it's titled, was published by Bonifant Press in 2015. Um, Mary was also poetry editor of the literary journal Southwood from 2016 to 2018. And her second collection, Stone Girl, was published by Dedalus Press in February 2019. And it was shortlisted for the Derek Walker Poetry Prize in 2020. Um, so, Mary, please. Um, Start us off um, and over to you. Um. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Cornelia. And um, uh, I must remember to look at the camera for you. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Paul and to the team at Ovale for inviting me. I'm absolutely delighted to be reading here today. And thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be reading with Matthew, Eleanor and Greg and looking forward very much to, to the event. Now, I thought I'd start off uh, with um, by um, because it's such a horrible day in Cork. And uh, although we're meant to be focusing on our own locality, I thought for the start, I'd go somewhere else. So I'm going to take us to the Languedoc in the south of France. It's also on the sea, of course, um, but uh, so that's where I want to go. Um, somewhere else. Somewhere else, it's a cold spring. Three cormorants are flying in, maybe, to huddle on a rainy weir. But here, at the Wednesday market, it's fat strawberries from the Garrigue 
and golden onions with wild green hair and inky octopus lolling on reefs of scarlet bell peppers. Through dapple dapple lime green freckles flickering on piebald bark and limestone clock towers and fountains, we drive, stopping at the sign of the scallop shell of St. James to drink the citrus wine and eat the sweet oysters of Bouzigue. In the streets of Set, a seagull presents himself at locked glass doors. Knock, wait, hop on, dome-headed pilgrim. Are you looking for your mate? She's been snared in nets, bamboozled by the oysters, the lake's slinky contortionists, shimmering underwater on their salty daisy chains. Gull cries, follow us. Somewhere else, three cormorants are raising a black flag above an icy river. That's Cork, by the way. <laughs> the, the cormorants are Cork. Thank you. you. You don't, you're very kind, but you don't need to uh, clap after each poem. So uh, now we're back to Cork. And so the River Lee and the Shaky Bridge. Ferryman, I step onto the shaky bridge as night is falling and sheets of rain are slapping at my face. No let up for three months now. A hooded figure sways in the murk. You go ahead and pass me out, ma'am, he says. I've had a few drinks. I'm tired. I walk past, mulling over the ma'am and the pass me out. Was he about to pass out? In passing him, was I wiping him out? Was someone passing on? In French, passeur is um, the word for, uh, sorry, passeur is the ferryman. Was this him then, washed up by the storms and walking slant across a dodgy bridge in Cork, swigging from a cider bottle and tired, so tired, from hauling his cargo of souls through the filthy fog, mugging the swollen waters of the Lee. I leap like a goat off the bridge and onto slippery steps spiralling upward. The glassy ground is littered with broken white china. Um, the next poem I'll read is um, from a sequence I wrote when my father was dying um, of Alzheimer's. And uh, he, uh, he was in his final months, actually in the month of November in 2016, uh, when we did have very uh, bad weather like this, I, I think, um, and uh, very... Uh, there was a lot of flooding in Ireland, I think, in 2016. And my father was dying at the time. And so I wrote this poem um, in memory of him. River Man. The great river is watering the dark, irrigating the central plain with black floods. The callow thing, no channel or lock can stem the seepage. Long November nights call the families creeping from farms, bits of furniture clamped under armpits. As the torrent breaks the weirs at Parteen, you loll your head on your breastbone, flower broken on the stem, as if resting on the shoulder of the farmer's daughter from Park Galbally, who gave birth to you above the bus bar for Moy in 1927. You were a running boy from the off, lining up neighbour kids for races round the fields behind the hilltop house, until you started to tog out for the foreign game. So small you could run between the goalie's legs, and you ran, you ran over all those waterlogged pitches. Afraid to lie down now, 
You spend your nights crooking your spine in a chair like a bent clothes hanger so that the fluid in your eye sockets is sluicing forward to fill the sacs of your upper and lower lids. Water is pooling in your calves and ankles and your skin under pressure is breaking down, letting the salt liquid seep through trickle in small rivulets down the shins you guarded with pads on the soccer pitch. <coughs> the great river is in trouble. Its drainage is failing and soon the swollen waters will break the ramparts and you will be carried away past the famine relief wall, past the young men's, past the bus bar, up Barrack Hill, and beyond the garrison pitch to kill Crumper, where wet sods will slow the running bones, clog, ball and socket, and you will lie down. Um, and after he died, um, I was walking by the river in Cork one day, uh, thinking about things and remembering a quotation from the French poet Paul Éluard who said, la terre est bleue comme une orange, the earth is blue like an orange. Like an orange. It's hard to stay standing on this blue ball as it spins. Its surface is covered in pocked matter that wants to draw you down, pull you in. The river's rim is smashed by angry tides and signs warn that the water wants to suck me into the holes that lie beneath. You tried running on the spot when you could no longer walk. I loved your wild refusal, your challenge to the earth's compulsion. You, the blind jockey riding the bucking bronco, hanging onto the scruff of its neck as it jigged, pain ricocheting through your broken ball and socket joints. And when at last you did fall off, I held my hand to the nape of your neck, found your heat still hiding there among the small hairs. The undertaker wadded your upper lip puffed your cheeks with embalming fluid, padded your rib cage, so skinny, a handsome corpse. But where were you? Dying is hard, said the butcher's wife. They're afraid to let go. As if they were separate, an alien species, nothing to do with the creepers over the zesty surface of the orange. I walk the river's bank, a mummy, a zombie, a robot, pre-programmed to march on, till the road runs out or a wave jumps up or a branch breaks and I am flung from the blue ball as it spins, reckless. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I can't lighten the mood very much because I seem to have chosen um, quite dark poems, but we can talk about that maybe later. Um, so the next poem, I won't read too many more, I promise, um, is called Elysian, and it was um, a commission for a, an anthology, the Elysian Tower. If you're from Cork, you know exactly what that is. I think it's the tallest building in Cork now, but it was built during the Celtic Tiger years a beautiful glass tower with very expensive apartments, which were meant for all the very wealthy people who were emerging during the Tiger years. But then when the crash came, um, the tower was essentially lying empty. And we were asked to write poems around uh, and about that tower block. And um, so I wrote the poem um, and it brought, I was brought up in Cork City, and in fact, down by the river. Uh, my parents were not, were very poor at the time, and they were renting a very small flat, which was backing onto the river, and my father worked in a timber yard. And I, I found myself remembering all of that, but there's a lot about the river in here. 
So it's called Elysian, and of course the Elysian fields uh, in Greek mythology were the fields where, they, where the, the souls of the heroes of the dead went after death. Elysian. Um, so I imagine that it's, the, it's after the apocalypse in my poem, and I imagine that Cork is completely underwater, and that I am the last survivor living at the very top of the Elysian Tower. All. <laughs> <laughs> it may happen yet if this rain carries on. So anyway, um, that, was, that was the idea. Elysian. Through green, I view the city's remains. Green glass of this colossal tower, relic of the tiger years, whose sole lodger is me, riding the crystal warship high above what used to be the skyline, now the waterline. Pea green from pole to pole. I spy with my little eye three green copper cupolas, the crowns of City Hall, St. Francis and the courthouse floating on moss green clouds. A golden flying fish, the city's flag, is still intact. I crouch above algal infinity, a hawk plotting the horizon in vectors. But my vantage is not safe. Bodies float by, debris of green cranes. At first, the floor show was all uprooted trees and cars. Then came the stampede, murders, cullings. I helped to fling the dead from the penthouse balconies. Now I lie alone on cool marble. The emerald light of evening floods the empty rooms, long redundant. I listen for sounds. Wearing of a lift in the shaft, the whoosh of automatic doors. Ghost lift, ghost doors. When I sleep, I go back to the old city. The mysteries of the timber yard on Water Street where my father worked. The temptations of the sidings of the West Cork Railway on Albert Quay. The olive majolica tiles of the Eglinton Street swimming baths bobbing before chlorine pricked eyes. Our flat on Lower Road, where water rats danced over our beds as we slept. My sister and I would play at skipping on the docks, watching for the timber boat boats coming up the river from Sweden, the banana boats gliding in from Africa or Jamaica, and we would wait for hours in the rain to snatch our prize, rotting bananas flung to us by the sailors. That was our playground, the port where Dutch merchants built their watery empire, a market where Bordeaux wine was swapped for butter. I close my eyes, try to conjure butter, the faces of my father and my sister, fields of flowers, Elysian fields where the gods went to die. Um, so I started by taking us elsewhere and I'm now going to take us elsewhere as also as some of you may know um, my partner uh, died in 2018 and when he was dying um, I went to a conference in Florida and um, I was in Obviously, it was a difficult time and he was dying, but I wrote this poem um, about Florida. So I'll finish with that. It's called Transportation in a Watery World. And I'll put you in the dugout canoe, like Moses in his basket of reeds, sent down river out of harm's way. I'll take you in that Seminole bark and we'll travel the waterways of Florida, the St. John's River and the Glades, gliding on the tracery of green veins through swamps and grassy marshlands. The grey beards of low-hanging oaks will tickle your wrists as you loll in the prow and I'll row for all I'm worth 
No Indian will shoot poison-dipped arrows at us from the mangroves, and there will be no water, white water rapids. The glades will cocoon us in a lace shawl of light as we slip along, drift, and sometimes rock gently in our floating cradle. The canoe will move slowly, but endlessly, through the watery green. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sharing these poems with us. Um, they are beautiful poems and um, resonate quite a lot of our theme of transitioning um, between different stages of life, um, our encounter with different forms of life. And um, there was, um, is, there's a sense of porosity um, in, in your poems as we travel from one stage to the next. And there's also a sense of how the water and how the rivers and the sea hold us and, and, and cradle us um, and accompany us on different stages um, during, during our lives. Um, and part of the reason why I decided on the sequence was that because I felt that some of that linked really well with many of Eleanor's poems. Um, and um, so let's move on then to Eleanor's readings. Um, Eleanor Rees is the author of four collections of poetry. Her most recent is The Well at Winster Solstice, which was published by Salt. Um, and her fifth collection is Tumlin of the Winter Park, which was published by Guillermo Press in 2022. Um, Eleanor is working on an academic book on post-human poetic practice and has worked extensively as a poet in communities. She's also a senior lecturer in creative writing at Liverpool Hope University, and Eleanor lives in Liverpool. Um, and um, when her when Tamlin um, was presented, Eleanor organized a beautiful reading in the space where it was where a lot of it, which was inspired, which inspired a lot of the poetry, and where I believe maybe some of it was written. So um, yeah, over to you, Eleanor. Ah, well, hello everybody. Um, it's so wonderful to be speaking to you um, from a fairly rainy and grey uh, Liverpool as well. Um, and just a huge pleasure to be reading, uh, reading into, um, into Cork um, from Liverpool. Um, I find, still find it extraordinary that these events are possible. So I'm going to be reading from uh, my new collection, which is this lovely um, Tamlin of the Winter Park, uh, published by Guillemot Press. Um, and as Cornelia just said, um, quite a few of the poems are located around the area where I live, you know, they have lockdown poems in a way, um, written with the local park. Um, and I like to think of myself as writing with um, environments and locations rather than about, and I hopefully we'll unpack that a bit later on. So I'm going to begin with a river poem to follow on from that beautiful reading we just heard. So this is River Mud. Slosh and rumple, seaweed bound in tide, Gulls scrap in the shallows. Crows mark your silvery sand now, river. Do I seep to mud or dry to stone? My will is strong as yours. My heart fluid, my blood your liquid. Grasses swell in your salty loam. Sandstone slabs, slate roofing tiles, a causeway along the waterline where a trickle of three-pointed stars, claw prints line the boundary. Your reach returns to the ocean, here is limited. Smashed glass sparkles in your algal shingle, your thoughts eroded, find recognition in my retina. To river mud I ask for direction, a crow on a slimy brick looks up at me, begins walking, feet in puddles, cool air in his open beak. So that's my address to the Mersey um, as it flows out into the Irish Sea. And I'm going to also read poems that are situated 
in the, the landscape of Sudley Park, which is walking distance from where I am now. Um, and many, many of the poems were written in situ in this location. Um, and I'm going to read the title poem, um, Tamlin of the Winter Park. <coughs> You walk ahead of me, beckoning, disappearing. You open the side of a tree, step through bark to another park, which is a series of rooms laid out on leaf mulch. And on a sofa near a sycamore, you lean on upholstery, smiling, gesturing, opening your arms. Then turn your back as I step into the glade. Muscular branches lean and block my way as I stop to see you, still grinning, still watching, asking, oh, how will you get in? A chimney puffs, bricks are built with grey. I peer in while you stare through a shining window. Come in, you say, come in. But when I place my palm on the handle, I push into air. And you are calling, not unkindly, oh, do come in. As I search in the leaves for a key to solidify walls, to make the barrier more convincing. And at the center of this parkland, thank you, at the center of the parkland is an old um, Victorian mansion house, Sudley House. And this is my response to this particular place um, and um, it's just rather imaginatively called Old House. Gone, it stands only as a shadow, a ghost of itself pulsing in the sun. Inside its transparent body, a tree, a stone cairn. Sun burnishes fires outside wooden huts. Blow through this sea gust, come inside, stay with us. And bright as the earth's red crust, the flames push through this thin place on the ridge as impressions of people stride across the heat and do not burn. Blow through this sea gust, come inside, stay with us. The figures are from later and see only furnished rooms where thin robed women stare down from walls into coals, bright in the fireplace, a winter's day. Blow through this sea gust, come inside, stay with us. Not July, heavy soot soaked rain down river from the city sticks to the glass. Whilst from the north window, daylight beats across the carpeted floor like a snake. Blow through this sea gust, come inside, stay with us. And the garden blooms with bursts of foamy murmuration of rose and wildflower, which root within the hill like songs playing out from a choir of voices. Blow through this sea gust, Come inside, stay with us. And the house is throbbing and can be undone with a squint of the eye and the lash of the wind, or the door is a wolf and is a mouth lined with teeth that bite onto time as it falls into the hall. Blow through this sea gust, come inside, stay with us. Amongst the bricks, time as a full breath by a beating chest. And the house balloons on the breeze, rainbow threaded and oily sheened, floats over the oak tree and out to sea. Blow through this sea gust, come inside, stay with us. Thank you. So, Sudley House, Sudley House is just blown away on the breeze. Um, and, um, but directly opposite um, this, this um, parkland is the old I.M. Marsh JMU um, estate, which is mothballed. So it's, a, it's, where, it's an old campus, university campus, which has been 
is is being closed down for several years now and is just waiting to be developed um and on the site of this um of the of the campus is an old another old victorian mansion called bark hill house um and you and the site is now cordoned off or is, is you can't get in but for a few happy months it you could get onto the site so i did some very gentle urban exploring and this is the poem that came from exploring that particular location this is called moth bald i am marsh campus bark hill house scraps of white paint fleck red brick steps garno spots the concrete under the veranda behind my back french doors to the hallway classroom chairs but turning west i look up and over past the salt grit box on the sloping track from studio to gym the river long so sharp shining wintry branches wind whipped pirouette sun global sways over dark paned accommodation blocks spherical street lamps light every evening for no one coming home to this faded mansion inside at a cracked window his wife notes again the elegant line of the water the sublime welsh hills drinking tea in perpetuity as over damp stained streaky wood chip magnolia slither visions of plantations tropical sunsets blood and at the top of the hill thank you at the top of the hill this is a very very local set of poems <laughs> um is a church and this church has had peregrine falcons nesting on it and greg will know about the peregrines i'm sure um one of the high spots of the <laughs> if there were any high spots of lockdown was visiting the peregrines so this is my poem for and with them peregrine falcons by the belfry slide across a square of blue between the sandstone tower and spring green trees triangular wings fixed realities against current supporting each journey over the twitchers cameras below feathers lie along the tarmac like the aftermath of a drunken party and in the porch a pigeon hunches to warm a nest behind a row of thin steel pins lining a notice board's dark wood rim posters invite attendance at the easter services and on a sandstone ledge her mate perches plump and gray eyes me nods i walk in light widening from gable windows and like a field of roses in bloom viewed from a hill above the valley pigeons line polished pews each warm body sat close to another at the altar no cross but more feathers and an egg on a silver platter the gods of the sky call like a round of thunder and all the birds ascend falcons to the sun and pigeons to the rafters as the day outside the window still does not blossom with rain and i'll just finish with a short poem that also addresses the river and takes us back down to the mersey which is about half a mile mile from where we are at the moment so thank you for listening. This is Riverview. Old villas on the esplanade smile as the flow drags daily past their sentience. And the tide comes, the tide goes. A lawn is cut, a willow swells, an arching back leans into sun and air as crystalline stalactites form between wood and masonry and the tide comes and the tide goes. The salt seals all entrances, 
a cossacid child stares through silvery binoculars to the green wood, gleaming chimneys, sunlight ignites a life buoy on a wave, and the tide comes, the tide goes. Two lost boys on the stones carry driftwood and a scrappy football, while the river on its journey west advances now in steady steps, and the tide comes, the tide goes. Timely is the force that pours this shore. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor, for these wonderful poems and for taking us as um, into, into the space, really, into Sudley Park and along the Mersey. Um, we're going to stay with the Mersey now. Um, and um, we're going to listen to um, Greg, Greg Query's reading. Now, um, Greg has lived in Liverpool since the early 1970s. Um, and since retiring from his position as a head teacher, he has written In Hardship and Hope which was published by GNK in 2017, which is a detailed history of the Liverpool Irish. His poetry book, A Stray Dog Following, published by Stairwell Books, was published in 2020. His recent collection, Oglet, celebrates the wildlife on the edges of urban Liverpool and alerts us to the threat to this precious environment. Now, I, I just want to share that yesterday I went down to Oglet Shore and it was a glorious day. And um, it's... Um, just walking, walking along it, listening to it, and taking in all the views um, was such a um, magical spot. Um, was such an such an ex such an experience of a of an almost magical sort of being um, on this on this beautiful shore. Um, and um, we've been talking about birds, and um, there was a kestrel. I think it was a kestrel hovering above. And looking down on me and it was just one of those moments where I thought oh those places along along rivers and in connection with the with the, with the wind and with the sea just really um makes us experience as humans just how little we are um and um and how um how little we must look to some of these other beings um that we share these spaces with um, so, Greg, over to you. I don't know if you want to say anything about the Save Oglet Shaw campaign as well. Uh, thank mm. you very much, uh, uh, Cornelia, and thank you very much to Obil for uh, asking me to read it. This is a real privilege, and it's very exciting for us in Liverpool to be addressing people in Cork, which for so long was the first stop for Liverpool, for migrants going from Liverpool to the United States. And I've just been uh, blown away by the poem I just heard. I, while Eleanor was writing her poetry, I was walking in the same area, and I know all those places well, and it's a very evocative description of Rossy Hill Church. Um, my, I was uh, walking a little bit uh, further south in an area which uh, is called an edge land, which is uh, those areas on the edge of our cities uh, where nature, where, where industry or development have abandoned and where nature has recovered. Um, my book is uh, called uh, Oglet, um, and uh, the cover is actually painted on a piece of uh, driftwood found along the shore of a, a curlew. Um, Cornelia has mentioned the actual Oglet area. I've, I've not selected, the, the second half of the book deals specifically with Oglet, and you can go on uh, Facebook and see the Save Oglet Shore campaign because the airport have plans to build on it. So we've only got 10,000 signatures on our petition. So if anybody wants to join the petition, you'd be very welcome to. Um, but the, the poems I've chosen for this reading are uh, Concern and Area, just a little bit north of Oglet, which is called Garston Reserve. It's bounded by the Mersey on one side, by an industrial estate on the other, by the airport to the south, and by uh, Garston suburb of Liverpool and Garston docks to the north. And this first poem, uh, to get to that on foot, um, I uh, have to walk through Garston Docks. And uh, this first poem is about uh, that journey. And the second one then takes you into the reserve itself. Garston Docks. 
This is the place for bottled gas, where you get more for less, for washroom hygiene and commercial cleaning, for ammonia in the nostrils, for shutter blind repairs and camping gear, for sawdust and goggles, where flaming space heaters hunched over like metallic herons crouch watchful while in dungarees with steaming tea they carry out open heart surgery on a diesel engine. Here lorry tires crunch potholes in their teeth. White-shirted, ducket-clutching office men splash urgently across the oily rainbow slicks that fill the cracks in concrete and red lights wink at pale van drivers waiting by the entry barrier. The burnt out building opposite, black blinded and forgotten, is host to carrion crows that caper awkwardly on window ledges, their appetite for flesh resurgent amongst the discards and the litter that have fallen from the makeshift. In the poisonous atmosphere of PVC and glue, playground inflatables balloon to life to the hum of clattering fan blades. A highest camper van is born again by fiberglass and filler. In a baptism of respray, Darth Vader fabricators in great asbestos gloves tip back their masks to wipe the sweat and catch the grey of dusk along the river. Here, in leftover land, those who know how burnish up the lived in, turn out the exhausted for another lap, make a living out of sight in the grease and grit to turn the wheels of the Leviathan. And here you come to an abandoned area, uh, a former uh, airport runway. Uh, it's called the Garston Reserve. Here is the hidden land, the half forgotten place where dry grass lies behind the fence, where the broad flat of the runway, abandoned now, comes to the Mersey banks. Here is the out of sight land without the riches of the city parks, poor relation of that family, looked down upon never talked about, the fallen on hard times land that must survive on what it can. Here is the wild land cut up in slices left to its own devices that makes the rules up as it goes along and never will be told how to behave. Here is the might have been land, the in-between land on which the stately mansion turns its back, where leftovers are discarded by the trade estate back of the allotments land where the spade is never sunk. And yet, how parsley springs amongst the burned out ends of abandoned things. Sparrows, foot soldiers in nature's ragged and depleted army, peck on plastic bags where butts lie in the dust. They have a beachhead here, those vagabonds. Squadrons of geese fly up the river. Cormorants come low over the water. Hawks hover. Seeds of sycamore are parachuting in to gain a foothold. Mice rustle in the briar. A fox trots confident along the rusted skeletons of jetsam, discarded and forgotten years ago. Elder, willow, ash and oak have now sunk their roots into the wasted ground. And from their cover, the land each spring becomes baptised anew by songs that ring and rinse afresh the air around. A prelude to the blessing of new life. Thank you. While I was uh, doing my lockdown walks in this area, um, it's quite the, the reserve is quite extensive, and on one corner of it, next to the industrial estate, uh, they built a car park, and uh, this is uh, imagining. Um, how that process took place. It's called car park. While they twist and snap the caps on bottles of spring water, the management decree from around the polished table, let there be a car park. They open up their folders at Appendix 3 to find the vacant lot identified as 17B bordered in red ink, a small space on the A4 map. Go tell it to the civil engineer, the accountant and the clerk of works what management has now decreed. D 
Descend upon this site, where black ants have their secret cities, where mice have burrows under brambles, where rose bays rise from out of rubble, and skippers lay their eggs in cocksfoot grass. Bring down the mighty bulldozers whose silvery hydraulic pistons glimmer in the light. Churn the soil to mud under the chunky black tires of dump trucks and heavy trenchers. Go give the word to one morning punch the starter button, chug the diesel engine into life with a breathy belch of black smoke, issuing a trumpet blast to every unsuspecting creature here that management has now decreed this little world is ended. And so one hard hat driver on just another day at work will accomplish on one shift what once would take 100 men a month to ensure within the span of just one morning that on this land there will never be another spring. For management decreed, let there be sturdy fencing of perfect little squares coated in green plastic to rise instead of willow herb. Straight lines and uniformity, right angles and rectangles, an end to the uneven and the wild, the silver ladders of the spider, the flights of butterflies. Let there be border paving slabs laid out in straight rows. Let there be flat surfaces, gravel paths and tarmac, straight white lines to demarcate each parking bay, conforming to the modern spec for safari jeeps and people carriers. And let there be a mighty fence to protect the sports utility vehicles and the diesel trucks from vandalism and wanton destruction. Thank you. Uh, this uh, last one, um, if, if, when you walk around in Liverpool, you never get very far without getting stuck in a conversation. Um, and, uh, this um, is, uh, I do many different uh, th things in the book, and one of the topics I do look at, which uh, um, Cornelia uh, referred to, is uh, the nature on the site. But uh, this poem is very focused on the people and looking at um, what different people see when they walk into an area like this. Um, it's called Ted Sees. Ted sees the gravel pile abandoned here last summer, the perspex on the information board scorched and blackened, the name spray painted on the sandstone, the curlessness of plastic bottles littering the ground, white dots of chewing gum on the fractured tarmac, black bin bags stuffed full, dog droppings, sweet papers, white tissue paper, beads of shattered glass on the flattened grass around the car park, the bent and twisted pipe by the entrance. Malcolm sees a hundred acres with no derelicts or residential concrete structures, just some random trees and bushes that could easily be stripped and leveled at little cost. Adjacent to the perimeter carriageway, remote from residential property, close to arteries of transport, the motorway, the railway, the airport and container dock. He sees the possibilities of warehousing, freight transport, aircraft services, bulk storage, processing, a call centre. Claire sees the complex show ecology against the backdrop of landform evolution, the intertidal flats, coastal erosion, sandstone outcrops, boulder clay, salt marsh and shifting silt deposits. The waders and the wildfowl of the Ramshaw coast with an annual mean peak of 47,000 geese. Derek sees the need for site management, signage renewal, barrier replacement, fresh green paint, walkways, gravel paths and guttering, curbs and verges shoring up along the drop, bird boxes, tree pruning, weeding, tidying the undergrowth, waste removal, landscaping, a public toilet, municipal investment, and prepares a long report for the Parks and Recreation Subcommittee. Margaret sees the space, the place to take the kids, where they, when they get too manic in the house, free from traffic and the noise, where she can have a ciggy, get a view across the water. There's nothing much here, not even picnic tables, but there is a bench where she can sit in peace a moment and they can run around mad as they like and shout loud as they want to out here. Kids need the space and they're not the only ones. Emma sees the fronds of bracken, delicate as lace, the hawk's beard and corn marigold, 
the ragged robin by the path, the sharp-toothed teasel and the yellow cornflower, chamomile for tea, elderflowers for wine, rose bay willow herb, blood red poppy, the black caps and the buntings in the brambles, the robin in the undergrowth, the sparrow hawk above, the chiff chaffs down below, and the meadow larks. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, yeah, so we um, so we are we are walking through like all sorts of different areas around which which emerge around rivers which are flowing into the sea, um, and um, we are also meeting sort of the different people that are in it with their different histories and their different memories. Yeah, which is um, which is another feature of of the poems as I was reading them and preparing them. Um, we are now returning sort of to the live reading in, in Cork. Um, and um, on the next poet to read is Matthew Geddon. Um, Matthew was born and brought up in the English Midlands. He was moving to Kinsale, County Cork in 1919. And his poems have featured in numerous magazines, journals and anthologies throughout Ireland and abroad. His full-length connections are Swimming to Albania, published by Bradshaw Books in 20, 2009, The Place Inside, Daedalus Press 2012, and most recently, The Cloud Architect, published this, this year in 2022. Um, so, Matthew, could you... I have a view here of the microphone, so if you um, want to and share your poem. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Cornelia. Uh, thank you, Paul, as well, for inviting me to take part in this event. Uh, and of course, thank you to the wonderful readers before me, Mary, Greg, and Eleanor. So I, I'm afraid uh, after hearing uh, lots of wonderful poems about the Liverpool area, my poems jump around a bit. So I hope you don't mind that. I mean, geographically, I'm not gonna be jumping around or anything <laughs> like that. So the first poem is, uh, I thought like Mary, it'd be nice to escape the rain for, for a few minutes. And the first poem is um, set in Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, 15 years ago, I helped a friend of mine, Desmond O'Grady, put together a book of his recollections of living in Alexandria in the 1970s. And uh, while we were putting it together, uh, Desmond was always saying, oh, one day we'll go to Alexandria. Of course, we never did, uh, but I did think maybe we'd go there in a poem. Alexandria. Together as ghosts we strolled, lost in a modernized world. Shops have been turned around, occupants moved on, rings run round their once bright eyes. Here in this imagined city of my heart, we chase Kavafi's shadow down blind alleyways, slip between light and dark as the sun appears to leave us. You tell me of the cafe bars your younger self frequents, a glass of conversation at the end of the day. I drink it all in, the dust hot air blown ashore, and the glitter of glances as we pass. Here we are in your last city, walking our way through lifetimes, empires falling as we talk, making our way to the port. Another poem set some years ago, uh, I think it was the first trip to Ireland, possibly myself and 
uh, my partner Caroline made, and we ended up uh, camping uh, in Lewisburg on the Mayo coast. And it must have been around midsummer because we were still chatting, talking in the fading light when we realized it was midnight. Uh, and the poem came out of that. And the poem's called Night Watch, which also obviously references the painting by Rembrandt, which is a bit misleading. The painting uh, was for a long time believed to be set at night. But in fact, the darkness uh, on the painting is due to the subdued, um, to the premature darkening of the varnish. Uh, and when it's cleaned, it, uh, when it was cleaned, it was obvious that it wasn't set at night. Night watch. That night, the disappearing Mayo light lingered long fooled us into thinking we were younger, still setting it out in the slow sunset of our youth. As the sky sank into firelight, we lay lazily beneath emerging stars, letting thoughts drift into cosmology and the comforts of space, watching a broad canvas of dreams unfurl. That was the night when your lips tasted of atomic dust, your yellow dress a shimmering sun, and the perception of motion moved us as we stilled. We shone easily then, light dispersing the shadows, unaware of the dark varnish that covers us all. Home more local now, uh, a beach not far from where I live, a secret beach, so I'm not going to tell you where it is. Uh, it's called uh, Paradise Beach. Stepping out of the air, we land on perfect sand. Small rocks glitter, ground down, shaped and polished, packed tightly beneath our feet. I think of the nostalgic days to come, the rain that has traveled on, emptying itself over mountains as we uncork wine, pour into beakers where it sloshes around, tilts towards the shore. Light spills over us, saturates the skin. I lie down by a rock pool and lower my head into another world, salt water drawn in to cleanse and wash away the filth. Night does not fall here, but rises from the ocean, reaching towards a believable heaven. We watch the colors disappear, climb out of the shadows and make haste, hurrying home to the past. Another beach, um, a lot of beaches here actually, I suddenly realised. Uh, this one was uh, a beach some of you may know, it's further away, but it's, it's in Galway on, in Connemara. It's a coral beach. Uh, when, you, when you see it from a distance, it looks like any normal beach, but as you get close up to it, you can see that it's not sand at all, but tiny little bits of coral. Um, I'm afraid I took a few pieces of coral from it, uh, and, um, and it remained in our car for a while. Um, it's a lot, again, it's, it's, it's quite a while ago. Paradise Beach. Sorry, Coral, but the Coral. I've already read Paralite, Paradise Beach. <laughs> Going backwards. Okay, let's go forwards. Coral. The Coral Beach crunches beneath our feet skitters across the floor to the left or to the right as we follow the wild Atlantic way driven or borne along by the prevailing winds, fragments scattered just like breadcrumbs or immaculate sea creatures reduced to dust. 
Carol Row is now long past, but still we turn corners in surprise, caught out by one new vista, a shimmering balm for the eyes. We too were exotic once, swam in technicolor, sea anemones, zoanthids, blue coral, soft corals, sea fans and sea whips, surreal reverie in last year's tides. Now we are ground down, debris in the ashtray, on the carpet or the car seat. Soon all coral will fade away, a reddish stain or slight blush as the afternoon filters into dusk. Caliban on Cape Clear. Here they are, like me, a breed apart. Tanned leather for skin and watchful eyes. There's no need to leave. We dine well and spin out the hours with stories. Spend our days as free men in pursuit of the green hair streak or tend to the melancholy tides of the heart. At night, though, this thing of darkness rages at the milky sea, seeks out the wreckage, the corroding cars. Between two worlds, the whales pass. I, tr I cry to dream again, to sleep at last. A few years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to spend a, a, a week or week and a half, I think, perhaps on uh, Sicily. Uh, um, and during that time, we took a ferry across and spent a couple of days on a little island off the coast there called Ustica. Um, Ustica, it turns out, was the place of exile for the Italian uh, writer and philosopher, politician, Antonio Gramsci. Exile on Ustica. And it has a, an, a small epigraph from Gramsci. I felt like I was living in a fantastic novel. Washed in on sepia tides of filth amongst the cardboard boxes, sofas, and a dog's head mask. You cross the lapis lazuli ocean, trip into port, and make yourself at home on the roof terrace. You are confined with comrades here, and what better place to begin again under undiscriminating skies? The thunder merely a rumour on a horizon that stretches its way to perfection. Your days spent half submerged in pools and turquoise caves. Who here will blame you for doing nothing to change the world? Thank you. This poem, The Infinity Pool, isn't really about a specific place. I just liked the idea of the infinity pool and I was kind of thinking about and I was thought, thinking, well, in a sense, uh, the universe is the ultimate infinity pool. The infinity pool. This is where you live, free to drift in milky calm, ignorant of where you are, the name of the solar system as you float through the evening sky. The others have made their way, dispersed in various directions, disappeared in the mist. This is where you swim, in and out of understanding, as clouds intermittently shadow the sinking sun, and the shore recedes to a distant cry as the waves march on, continue their disintegration of the castles on the sand. This is where you disappear, an arm, a leg, 
a shout that no one hears, no one remembers you, and the splash you make is lost beneath the wind, the roll of ocean, and the stars that glitter shine knowingly on the deep. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll just finish then uh, with a poem uh, that I began writing for Derek Mahan, uh, but unfortunately, uh, by the time I'd finished it, Derek had passed away. Uh, I'm a slow writer. Um, so it's based on a, a journey. I went to China a few years ago on a residency in Nanjing. Uh, and while I was there, took a train journey. The train crossed this huge lake, like shot across the lake like an arrow. Uh, at some speed, um, I could just see water either side of the train. It was it was like we were hovering over the surface. Uh, and we went to Gaochun, which is a place in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but there was an amazing market there with a, a street still, um, you know, pretty much untouched from the Ming Dynasty. There's a couple of words you might not know. Sampans are just like those flat-bottomed boats that you see on the on the little streams and rivers there and then Lao Wai is a, a Chinese name for it's a kind of an insulting name for a Westerner and uh, got called it many times um, but uh, we did uh, when we went to myself and a friend when we went into Gaochun we went down this little side street and this poor child had clearly never ever seen Westerners before. I took one look at us and went running home screaming. Um, don't usually have that effect. Uh, there's also a reference at the end of the poem to uh, Derek Mann's poem, The Mayo Tao. The Journey. Derek, I'm south of the old Yangtze River where evolution is measured in cultural artifacts recovered from its muddy shores. Waterways crisscrossed by wooden sampans sculling through the ragged weeds. This is the land of the hairy crab, dredged from the silty bed destined to become breakfast, lunch or tea. Meanwhile, modern man is fired across the lake an arrow hurtling through empires, coming to rest in the Ming dynasty. Fulfilling ancient prophecy, Lao Wai emerged from dust. A terrified child runs home. Wild-eyed and whiskery, I near the marketplace when I think of you. If you were here now, we might seek out a Chinese traditional medicine pharmacy cure all your ills. Instead, I begin a poem. Derek, I'm south of the old Yangtze. It sings like a marching song. Onwards, the day rolls back beneath my feet. A year later, and I'm still roaming the alleyways of Gaochun. Here, they're chopping wood, boiling fish down pokey side streets selling Mao on coins or shiny badges. The shopkeeper unfurls a scroll before me. It's the way, he says. Taoism in characters carefully transcribed. I try to follow the symbols, an indeterminate journey, constant revision between qualities, the beginning and the end. It will all come right this winter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew, for these um, for these beautiful poems. And um, part of my thinking behind the sequence was that Mary took us traveling for a little bit um, and then also had a sense of walking along the river in Cork. Um, and then we went to Liverpool and explored sort of in a more place-based way. And then um, Matthew took us, took us traveling again to, to different places, which is also the sea and the rivers as 
um, connectors as um, as passageways um, to different to different places. Um, I think the chairs are being set up for for Mary and for Matthew to sit there. Is that is that right? So um, could I just um, could I ask you to come to come back, please? And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to suggest um, to suggest a few themes that came up for me as I was listening, and I'm going to ask you to respond to it. And as you respond, I think you can also um, address the other poets, um, the other poets who read and um, respond respond to their work. Um, and um, one or two themes really that um, came up to me as I was listening to the poet to the poems was um, the rhythm. Um, and the sounds um, which form part of any seascape or river or of the ports that are connected to them and which of course become a lot more well audible and noticeable in the readings themselves rather than when we when we read the poems on paper and the other theme that came up for me was also light and lighting and the different shades of, of um, light and fractured light um, that um, that um, that sort of um, emerged in 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 several um, in several of the poems. Um, so I was wondering, maybe we can start with a with a little reflection um, on these on these factors like the light, um, the fracturing of light, the shimmering. Um, the illumination, um, and also this is um, there we can pick up from uh, Mary's um, comment on the dark, yeah, because um, because dark and light um, sort of merge into each other in many of these poems. Um, so, um, Mary, since you brought up the idea um, the idea of darkness, do you do you maybe want to? Um, start us off with that um, well it's, it's difficult i suppose to be precise um but uh you know i i guess i wouldn't be alone in uh not being fully aware i suppose when i'm writing poems that i am writing about light i mean or even water you know i was actually quite surprised when I went through my poems to pick out a bunch for this event uh, because I thought, God, I, I don't have any poems about ports or, you know, I, I was aware that the sea and the river was there a bit, but, you know, and then when I started to look, I realized that river was there a lot, you know, um, so it's not, it's not conscious, but I guess it's inevitable, or is it? that uh, a writer is influenced by the place and the environment, uh, the physical environment, the geography. Um, one thing that struck me um, in today's readings was, and I, I suppose it's more a question really, um, you know, because I think Greg and Eleanor, but they can disagree with me if they like, uh, maybe had a specific project in mind for the particular books that they were reading from, um, and you know, is is that a slightly different thing? In that, there is a project to focus on a landscape. I'm thinking, in particular, of, of you, Greg, maybe the 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 the, the post-industrial landscape, uh, uh, you know, around Liverpool and that. And um, is that a different thing? To I mean, it, to let's say the ordinary way of just writing poems and they end up eventually in a collection. Um, or I guess you could say that some poets are more sensitive to, to landscape. And I mean, uh, personally, I am very interested in, uh, you know, psychogeography in, in just the sense of a place. And uh, I think you use the word uh, Cornelia porosity. Well, um, I would always, I'm conscious that I am aware of his, the history uh, of a place, for example, when I go to a new place, um, 
It would often be to do with stones and, and buildings and that, but I would be aware of the ghosts of the past, I suppose, in whatever places I go to. Um, but uh, so I am aware, I suppose, of, of place to that extent. Um, but uh, the dark, I mean, uh, you know, it just so happens that I've had a lot of death in my life in recent years and there, therefore my poems are influenced by that, you know. Um, so I don't know if, I, if Matthew would like to pick up from that. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what you're saying there. I don't really work uh, at the moment towards projects, it's more individual uh, poems um, and in, in concerning the, the light and dark, I think uh, you can't really avoid it really, those changes uh, living in Ireland and particularly living by the coast, uh, you know that old thing of uh, if you don't like the weather just wait 10 minutes and then uh, uh, it will be different, uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that, uh, the light and the dark. Uh, for me, I, I instantly think of the sea, I instantly think of a particular beach, uh, Garrettstown really, where the light is so incredible, particularly at this time of year. Um, you've got the, the low sun and you've got this light like striking the waves, I mean it, it, it's very inspirational for me. Uh, so, so light and dark sort of uh, come and go really, uh, inevitably I think, um, yeah. Maybe um, uh, thank you. Greg or Ellen, who would like to comment? Yeah. Um, Greg, do you want to maybe carry on since um, Mary particularly referred to yeah. your collection? Um, yes, uh, I think Mary is uh, absolutely right um, that uh, my book um, became a campaign. I was I was walking during lockdown, walking through the area, and I thought to myself, I wrote a poem, and I thought. Um, how could I possibly write 40 poems about this area? But I found with every day that I walked there during lockdown, new ideas came to me. And it's certainly true that it ended up as being quite polemical and quite dedicated to, I was already well informed about <clears throat> the question of edge lands because around Liverpool, agricultural land, there's no wildlife there. In all the developed industrial areas, very little wildlife there. And it's these edge lands that are an oasis for these creatures. Um, regarding the light, um, I certainly every year have the experience of going back to Ireland and seeing the amazing light you have on the ocean there. Um, I think what you're looking for in the natural world in somewhere like the Mersey, I walk in the Mersey nearly every day and it is different every time because of the view across the estuary and the clouds and so on. Um, but I, I think you um, need to... Uh, take from it uh, a sense of place. Uh, you, you don't look for the spectacular sunsets or views you might get in Ireland, but there is uh, plenty there to um, arouse the spirit and to give you thought and to uh, be worth uh, preserving and holding on to. Yeah, and we do have some spectacular sunsets on the Mersey. Oh, we do. Yeah. 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 Um, Eleanor, do you want to carry yeah, on? Yeah, I'd love to come in on all of that. I, so I grew up in Birkenhead on the other side of the River Mersey. Um, and so we very much have grown up in these post-industrial landscapes. Um, and I think I agree very much with what Greg was saying there about find, trying to find, find the beauty in these landscapes as part of the regeneration or the non-existent, you know, there is regeneration in Liverpool, but not in these edgeland areas and sometimes the regeneration is more harmful than um, beneficial I think as, as Greg was talking about there in, in relation to Oglet Shore. Um, in terms of the idea of the my book wasn't a project as such it, it just happened to be that um, I was writing very locally partially due to the circumstances of the lockdown but that is something I've, I've always done because I'm very interested in um, trying to reimagine and reperceive places and therefore communities or um, experiences that are thought of as marginal or perhaps um, not um, poetic and trying to find the poetic because the poetic is always there if we can imagine 
uh, vividly enough. So for me, there's a cre creative challenge, which I just find, you know, in very um, necessary for myself is, is to continuously try and find and, and, and connect um, with, with the, the, the living animism of, of the place, even if it's not apparent on first view. Um, yeah. Um, can I just um, follow on from that and then maybe we can do the circle sort of backwards. Um, and um, when I when I wrote um, a message yesterday to the po to the poets to, to all of you kind of saying these might be the themes I might be talking about or that I might bring up or that were my responses. Um, one one term I used was the non human irresistible. And um, that was something that um, struck me in all the poems in very different ways. Um, there's an irresistible pull or attraction um, to that which is not human or which goes beyond the human um, and beyond sort of our um, conscious time um, on this planet. Um, and I did wonder whether maybe that connection of wind and water um, might have to do with that irresistibility, um, which is also a type of humility um, before these elements with, um, with, which we, with, with which we cohabit and which give us life and with all the other creatures that we, that we share it with. Um, so, Eleanor, um, could you respond to that one please yeah i love that um term in in the email you sent yesterday I, I i paused over that for a while irresistibly and i'm still thinking about it now um in the there was there was almost connecting back to your previous point about it, focusing on a light and water and um i think these i try and see these as communications from the, the location so these are forms of language that i'm engaging with and so they are participants within the poem they're res i'm responding to they're provoking and interacting with so but i would want to give them an agency um for that um and therefore they perhaps need to be irresistible and they have to have some kind of quality you know quality to them they have to be something that is non-human that i can't ever fully access um, but it's the desire <laughs> that's provoked to access and commune and communicate that perhaps generates the poem. So I love that term irresistible, the fact that you suggest boundary at the, the threshold space, at the threshold between the human and the, the more than human. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg, I was... Um... I was thinking because you um, mentioned management several times, which I did wonder whether that is almost a defense against that irresistibility um, or how um, that how that gels, because it's a, it, management is an attempt, an attempt to control, isn't it? It is an attempt to control, um, but it's also um, you could get people sitting around that management table who uh, go to bird reserves at the weekend and are committed to nature, but the way that uh, companies and finance is structured, uh, they sit there and tick the box. And uh, that's one point. Another point is that they may well think that what they're doing is in an area of little value in the poems attempting to establish that it has got value. Uh, I think you're, you're, it's a very important point that you've made. Um, I think we're at a kind of... Uh, point in human consciousness, which was uh, quite strongly hinted at in Matthew's writing, um, th th that um, we need to be more aware of what we are on the earth and how, um, where our place is in it. Um, and our hope is that in future, we're now at a turning point in future generations, we'll be more uh, sensitive to all that. Um, a lot of the point about my poetry is that it's the last area of green uh, inside Liverpool city boundary. Can we not just leave one little area? And it's a question we're going to be facing uh, increasingly. But uh, I, I think it's, it's a very important question. It will become uh, more important in years to come, the relationship humanity has 
the attitude towards nature and our understanding of it and our place in it and our chances of survival. Thank you. Um, Matthew, do you want to carry on on this reflection? Sure. Um, so, so the non-human irresistible uh, uh, made me think particularly of water and, and the pull and the draw that, that I have and I think we all have to water. I mean, after all, we are 60% water ourselves. Uh, the planet is three quarters water, so we cannot help but commune with it in different ways. Uh, um, the philosopher Thales of Miletus said that water is the cradle of all philosophy, that everything comes from water. Uh, and, and certainly in my experience, you know, living by the sea um, and near ports and harbours, you can't help but be part of that. Um, and the poem that I read earlier, the infinity pool, I think it was, had a moment where I put my head into a rock pool and suddenly you, you enter into this other world, these, these different colours, different shapes, different things. And I've, I've noticed it as well, uh, snorkeling or, or things like that, where suddenly, you know, you dip your head down and that there is this other world there uh, that we don't treat well you know the, the the oceans are full of plastics as we all know uh so i think we need to be more aware of that other world uh, and more conscious of it really and that that draw that we have should uh, make us a little bit more kind of uh um willing to change i i would hope thank you mary do you want to uh, I mean, I just to follow on from what Matthew has said about the um, the watery <laughs> dimension um, of of well the human body and uh, therefore our literally our, our the pull of um, of water uh, you know for the human body and I suppose as poets we're uh, or as a, you know, we're, we're asking questions, you know, we're trying to find, we're trying to discover. I Recently I read a description, uh, something which said that artists can be divided into two groups, those who are seeking to understand by making the work of art and those who are setting out maybe to describe or tell a narrative or a story. And um, I mean, I don't know if it's that, easy to categorize artists because for me all artists must surely be seeking to understand there are questions and so just in my mind today given the context of the topic we're discussing i'm thinking about the life of the body itself which is, is very material and is connected of course through its materiality to the earth and to water to the elements um, to salt, to, uh, yeah, to the air, to the earth, to the water. And so, but the body is something we don't really understand, of course. It's our, it's our human nature, our human condition. Our minds are trained in a particular way by our education, particularly in the West. You know, it's, it's, it's very uh, focused on the rational mind, uh, you know, on uh, analysis and so there's that there is the understanding that the mind can bring to bear on things but there's also the understanding of the body which I think probably escapes us it's more to do maybe with what's buried in the in the unconscious in a way so but but that's in a way the, the big it's where the big questions reside you know where did we come from and where are we going and no matter how educated you are and how much of a scientist you are you essentially don't know the answers to those questions so that the human body walking around the earth is is always looking for answers that's the irresistible pull and you know the answers, I guess we're looking to the physical world very often to give us those answers. Now, of course it doesn't, but we're always there knocking and it's the physical body, what, you know, that pull towards the physical earth and looking, tell me, give me the answer. What am I, you know? 
so that, that that's my feeling about about your phrase. That, that's what it triggered, at least in me, uh, Cornelia. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, I think we've come to the end of this event. It's a pity that we can't keep on talking. <laughs> Um, but um, maybe there will be some other opportunity in the future. Um, I would like to thank everyone for the beautiful poems, for the thoughtfulness, for um, inviting different modes of knowing and of understanding, some of which are intellectual, some of which are related to the mind, some are related to the sensations, to our perceptions and to our ability um, to respond and to interact and to be in all humility, part of something which is much bigger than us and which holds us. And if we destroy it, we will disappear with it. Um, and it seems that maybe port cities and shorelines and water and edgelands are precisely the spaces where those kind of um, perceptions and questions become most acute um, and also most bearable because the water always holds us in a sense. Um, and I think with this, um, I will say goodbye to everybody. Um, before I do so, um, there's a few thank yous, of course, to everyone who read, everyone who spoke, to everyone who listened, um, because poetry without, without listeners um, is always incomplete. Um, and um, to the organizers, to OVO in particular, who are always creating these listening spaces where we can come together. And um, then also to the research project Poetry and Politics 2, which is funded by the Spanish state and based at the University of Vigo. And they have been helping us um, to organize, well, to organize and to fund um, these, this event, particularly um, this year. And um, yes, with this, I wish everybody a very beautiful day. And um, I look forward to the upcoming events, which I will follow online. Um, so I don't know um, if Paul wants to come and uh, come to the microphone and make a transition um, to the next <laughs> event. Thank you, Cornelia. Thank you.